To our new listeners, welcome. To our old listeners, welcome back. Another episode of Magical Education awaits you, but first we would like to say a few words. Nitwit, blubber, oddment, tweak. Podcast nine and three quarters topic of the week is Australian magical culture. G'day listeners, my name's Jem. And g'day listeners, my name's Rhea. <laughs> Why didn't we start every episode with g'day? We should have been doing that from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, g'day is like a cultural thing, so I guess it fits here. <laughs> yeah, it is a cultural thing, but also like we're the only Australian Harry Potter podcast. We should have been setting ourselves out, making ourselves different <laughs> right from the very first episode. Fools. True. Six yeah. years in and we're still making mistakes. <laughs> wasted. Wasted opportunities. Wasted opportunities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, just quickly, before we get into culture today, I just want to say quickly, I, we got some feedback about our Creatures episode from one of our close friends and former host, Belle. Um, she was on our Gryffindor Identity episode, and she said that she loved it and all of our suggestions, but she also thought that we should have brought up dugongs. Mm. So for anyone who doesn't know, dugongs are like a kind of seal-type creature, uh, like a manatee. Yeah, I was going to say, they're also called manatees. Yeah, and they're quite common around Australia, and it used to be folklore that fishermen and sailors would see dugongs and think they were mermaids, because, Mm. you know, that's a classic thing. Yeah. So she thought, why not have dugongs that are actually mermaids, or like even like a selkie-type creature might be fun, so Mm -hmm. I think that's cool, we're adding that to our canon. (laughs) Yeah, I like the idea of dugongs that are dugongs in the water, but then when they go on land, they transform into women, and that's where the mermaid myth came from. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, very cool. (laughs) Love that. All right. Culture. Culture. This is going to be a big episode, so I think we should just dive straight in. Yeah. I want to start by saying cultures are diverse, Yeah, and we're going to be speaking in big old sweeping generalizations here. <laughs> yeah. Once again, we're two white Australians on stolen land. Our views yep. and, lim- and perspectives are limited by that. We'll try and do our best to cover as many bases as possible, but that's not possible in our time limit and with our limited mm-hmm. perspectives. So yeah. we would be much more enriched from the voices of others. So please feel free to critique, add on to, and give us feedback. We'd love to hear it. So I broke culture down into three major categories. And cool. those categories were institutions, yep. social behavior, and then the third category was magic, which is just going to cover all the wizard <laughs> stuff that doesn't apply to muggles. <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs> Maybe we should start with, like, social behavior and what you've got on that, like, cultural archetypes and stuff. Okay, start with social stuff and then go back to institutions. Yeah, because that might, like, if we have that social foundation and we understand how the cultures work, we might be able to look at our institutions better. That makes sense. Okay, so the first thing I did when looking at social behavior was I came up with uh, some different archetypes, or some different types of, like, archetypal Australian characters. Sure. And I mostly did this because I think it's going to be relevant later. It's going to be relevant in this episode too, but remember this for next episode. (laughs) So for reasons, I came up with four archetypal Australian characters, and this is going to be me monologuing for a while, but I'd like to run through them. (laughs) Sure. So are these yours, your inventions, or are these like actual archetypes? (laughs) Uh, A little bit of both. I didn't pull these out of thin air, but I, I... have decided they are archetypal Australian characters. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> You'll see what I mean when I get into them. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first archetypal Australian is a bush ranger. Yeah, yeah, yep. I see what you're talking about. Ned Kelly was an Australian hero. You know what I'm going with. What was this? <laughs> Ned Kelly was an Australian hero. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, bush rangers started out as escaped convicts back in the very early years of colonisation, so the early 1800s. But mm-hmm. bush ranging as a lifestyle lasted for over a century, and it's iconically Australian. Mm-hmm. Bush rangers were armed robbers who lived in the bush, on the run from the cops, and they've robbed banks and coaches and travellers. So the best mm-hmm. known is Ned Kelly, an Australian hero, and the Kelly gang. Uh, Ned Kelly is really, really iconic because he made himself a rough suit of armour out of basically scrap metal, and then he used that armour to survive shootouts with cops. Yeah. Here's a quote from Wikipedia. Native-born bushrangers also expressed Australian nationalist views and are recognised as the first distinctly Australian characters to gain general recognition. Sure. As such, a number of bushrangers became folk heroes and symbols of rebellion against the authorities, admired for their bravery, rough chivalry, and colourful personalities. (laughs) 
So yeah. despite the fact they were just like they were just outlaws and violent criminals, <laughs> Australians have this really romanticized view of the bush rangers because they symbolize freedom, especially from our roots as a convict colony. Sure. Mm-hmm. So that's the first Australian a bush ranger. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the second Australian archetype is a larrikin. Yeah. Larrikins are clowns. They're mischievous, rowdy, <laughs> good-hearted, but they don't follow social conventions. They're scoundrels. Yeah. The larrikin first started being used in Australia in the later 1800s, so after the bush ranging era, to describe rebellious young people. Some mm-hmm. of the first earliest generations of Australians, like Australian born people, defining themselves as separate from the British. Okay. Also, larrikins started out being both male and female. It was just a term for young people, basically, and then later mm-hmm. became associated with males because there was a close connection between larrikins and diggers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Diggers are Australian soldiers, especially the Anzac soldiers Anzacs. of World War mm. One. Yep. That was where the larrikin began to be associated with self-mockery and dark humour in the face of death. Here's another yep. quote from Wikipedia. After the armistice, the larrikin digger characters were increasingly celebrated as quintessentially Australian. The idea that a real Australian was a bit of a larrikin crystallised. Okay. Our third, well, my third kind of Australian is uh, the Aussie battler. Oh, okay. Yeah, a battler. (laughs) This is a caricature of contemporary Australian culture. Ordinary, working class, true blue, hardworking people who keep going no matter the odds. Sure, okay. Battler is a term of respect and endearment for underdogs. I wouldn't say it's necessarily accurate, but it's how a lot of people (laughs) see themselves. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. I, yep. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of pride associated with the idea of toughing it out against whatever hardship there is. It's also yeah. strongly tied to the idea of mateship, which is huge in Australia. The idea mm-hmm. of mateship is that we look out for each other. We're all in this together. We stand with our mates. The bonds between people are more important than differences. Apparently, that comes... I didn't know this until I was researching. The idea of mateship comes from the land being so harsh that we had to support mm-hmm. each other to survive, unlike in other countries where there's a culture of the land nourishes, provides, protects, and we should be mm. thankful. So there's competition. Yeah. yeah. The North American USA uh, culture of Thanksgiving, that's because their yeah. land is bountiful and provides. Our land is harsh and kills us, so we have <laughs> mateship, not thankfulness. <laughs> we should have May 8th as mateship day or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate. And then the final archetype this is one that i've kind of created because i took two archetypes that like weren't really anything on their own and combined them into a new category so this one's this is a Rhea original (laughs) okay the final archetype i'm calling the bushman or the bush poet sure it's a combo of bushmen like steve Irwin, russell Mm coit crocodile dundee and then bush poets like banjo patterson and dorothea mckellar okay I'm saying this is characterized most by a deep love and appreciation of the land, the Australian land and environment, including animals. So that's Steve Irwin calling all crocodiles beauty and Mm -hmm. McKellar writing my country, which is often called I love a sunburnt country, which I think I've Mm -hmm. quoted before in previous episodes. It's an iconic poem about the Australian land and her beauty and her terror. Yeah. Uh, This is also characterized by respect and admiration for the indigenous peoples and their culture. So Rod Ansell, you might not know him, but he is the real life man who Crocodile Dundee is based on. Mm -hmm. I do know him. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) A wild person with a truly insane life. Uh, He was fully initiated into his local indigenous community. He spoke Mm -hmm. their language fluently. He was given a traditional Aboriginal burial in Arnhem Land after his death. He Mm -hmm. also died in a shootout with cops, like all iconic Australians should. Mm -hmm. So that's the Bushman Bush Poet. Okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Ta-da, end of monologue. (laughs) (laughs) I do, I I have heard before the larrikin stereotype and like how that informed the Anzacs. Wasn't that also sort of drawn from Indigenous Australians and like their laissez-faire sort of attitude towards nature and travesty? I think like I've heard that before where it's like that's sort of been co-opted as well. I think Um, so. That makes sense. Yeah, like, in terms of, like, having a good-natured approach to, like, bad things happening, being Mm -hmm. sort of relaxed, being casual, having good humour, that's apparently sort of, like, a bit of an appropriation from 
indigenous people which i wouldn't be surprised about yeah. as well that certainly fits with yeah my understanding of both the idea of the larrikin <laughs> and with indigenous culture that fits perfectly together. yeah that's a so, huge yeah. component of mateship and australian culture so yeah mm-hmm. good ones <laughs> yeah so from that what i'm thinking of as like the social behavior of australian witches and wizards is they are irreverent friendly aggressive brave dumb dumb in the way that all wizards are dumb <laughs> yeah like our culture is we are uncultured yeah. <laughs> okay so that's everything that i well that's not everything that i have that's the beginning of what i have for social behavior do you want to keep going through more social behavior stuff? yeah yeah please i didn't have anything on social behavior so let's go okay cool so i'll just cover this section <laughs> That was my monologue, but feel free to cut in and correct me (laughs) with more stuff. That was like what I was calling social norms. Yeah. The next thing I had was social values. Mm. I said that I think the values or the primary values of Australian culture are mateship, hard work, and a fair go. Yeah. Basically sport values. Sport values. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not sure if they necessarily line up with Australian behavior, particularly in how racist this country is, Mm -hmm. but that's what we would... That's what we Say idolize. Our ideals are. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. That's how we always promote ourselves, and we always promote ourselves as a multicultural country, which is true. We are yeah. a multicultural country, but there's not mm-hmm. enough, in my opinion, respect for that multiculturality and that diversity. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. In theory, we're a multicultural nation. A quarter of Australians' population was born overseas. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, racism and discrimination is prevalent, big and alive and well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, more on values, uh, tall poppy syndrome is yes. absolutely a thing here. <laughs> so, the idea of rising above or being better than the people around you, that's treated really, really harshly. Yep. Because it's against the idea of mateship. We should all be in this together. Yeah. If one of if one of us is better than the others, then that person needs to be taken down a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's such a thing. It's such a thing, especially yeah. in friend groups, where it's like, mm-hmm. say, you've got a group of friends and one of your friends gets promoted or gets some sort of like big achievement like they're getting married or something like that yeah and like all the other friends are like oh congratulations but also get fucked like yeah <laughs> like oh <laughs> like it's, you, you're gonna have fun with your fancy lads at your promotion <laughs> or like why are you telling all of us single people that you're getting married go fuck yourself like it's it's a <laughs> yeah but it's all in jest and it's all like appreciated it's it's sort of like a compliment <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it is it's like it's that thing where 90% of it is a joke, but then that core 10% is like, also, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I said this is tied to anti-intellectualism. Yeah. Mm, Rather yeah. than a culture of us re- wanting to be successful, Australians want to define themselves as ordinary and working class. Yeah. Casual, cool, chill. Like... Yeah, we're chill. It's all fine here. Don't worry about it. And I think, like... It's hard to define your own culture from the inside out, but yeah. I think part of what makes Australians seem really laid back to other parts of the world is that, like, we we promote this idea that we are really laid back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't have a lot on customs. For customs, I think... Should I define these categories before I start going through them? No. Nah, we'll just cover them as we go. It's chill. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Something that you said in a previous episode was we use eucalyptus smoke for indoor fires. Mm. I was thinking also eucalyptus smoke for magical barbecues. Hells yeah. That's great. (laughs) And the only other thing I had for customs was being drunk a lot. (laughs) Yeah, that's, I literally put that down in culture. Like our biggest cultural activity is being drunk outside or drinking Mm. outdoors. Like that is it. Every single public holiday or barbecue or celebration that is how we celebrate we go into the outdoors and drink yeah <laughs> like <laughs> barbecue sport sunbathing going to the beach it's all being drunk outside yeah that's how australians celebrate everything <laughs> so i really think like you know how butterbeer is a big part of the harry potter universe and i think mm-hmm. it's been stated before that butterbeer is not alcoholic because kids yeah. drink it i don't think that's the case here i think butterbeer when it was introduced here was not alcoholic but very quickly became like kid whiskey yeah absolutely <laughs> like a hundred percent it is alcoholic <laughs> yeah it's like hooch something that i had in my magic section was because we like to drink australian magical brewed alcohols are absolutely a thing oh yeah a ton of our potions are just alcoholic even if they don't need to be <laughs> yeah i could really say that <laughs> like have this potion to heal you from your surgery but also you can get plastic i mean like australian it. wines are famous like it's it makes sense that definitely like alcohol is just a bigger factor here than it is in the uk mm-hmm. i also had 
for beliefs, I think a major belief that we have, and it's something that I've clashed against in the main Harry Potter series over and over again, mm. I don't think we have the concept of dark creatures. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. one. Yeah. Mm. Because we don't sort our animals into good and bad. All of our animals are dangerous. Yeah. So we rate them based on danger, I guess. There's, like, animals that are a little bit dangerous, mm. like, I guess, kangaroos and koalas that go in the softer end of the scale. Yeah. And then or animals snakes. that are medium dangerous. Yeah. Like, I guess, dingoes, even goannas emus. and stuff I would put into this category. Yeah. Emus. And then really dangerous, which are, like, our funnel webs and our red belly black snakes and, yeah. like, our fucked animals. Blue ringed octopus. Cassowaries. Yeah. But, like... I think obviously when it was like first pre colonization like first post colonization contact, all there was much more of a British idea of like, you know, dangerous mm. animals and like I would I would see that like we know that care of magical creatures and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them exist in a response to the original historical way that magical creatures were treated, which is they were treated as beasts mm-hmm. and they were killed and they were hunted. Um so I think that energy would have been there initially, but it would have progressed to where we are now in the real world in Australia where, Mm. yeah, we have our animals and we have our dangerous animals, but we also have this sort of like national pride in our animals and this respect for them where, yeah, there's dangerous animals out there, but just don't touch them. Don't provoke them. Don't go near them. Like, you know, it's, it's on you if you get bitten by a snake to some extent, like, you know, (laughs) yeah. Fuck around and find out. Exactly. So I definitely think that entire culture has changed and maybe, yeah, you're right. We wouldn't have the concept of of dark creatures in a magical sense. We would just have magical creatures and yeah, like care of magical creatures is a huge component of the schooling. Like, I think even in the muggle world, there is the idea that some animals are evil. Like there are people who think sharks are evil and Mm. should be killed. I, that is not a thing in Australia. Not to the same extent. All. No, definitely not. No. no. Like, I'm sure there's some dumb people who think all snakes should be killed with a shovel or whatever. Yeah. But mostly it's just like, uh, look, our environment is dangerous and you just have to kind of live with it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we get, like, snake safety training when we're children and stuff. Yeah. Like, there's definitely a culture of some people being like, oh, we should put up shark nets and make sure sharks don't hurt people and sharks are evil. But it's definitely not to what I've seen in, like, America. Like, no. it's it's very much more normalized here to be, like, sharks are natural and beautiful creatures. And, like, mm-hmm. every single aquarium you go to and every sort of zoo you go to, they have loads of information and scientific facts about sharks and how important they are and how they're actually good mm-hmm. and they're not evil and all that sort of stuff. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, ve- it's very much not a culture of, like, these animals are bad and should be wiped out or anything. No. It's like, these animals are dangerous and should be respected. Yes, that's the it's culture. It's less... Yeah, it shouldn't. It's not we should cull sharks. It's we should find out where sharks are and then not swim there. Yeah. We should swim in places where sharks aren't. Exactly. Or if you're like us growing up, swim where the sharks are when they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I get bitten by a shark, that is on me. I'm in its house. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't need to be there. <laughs> The water is the shark's house. If the shark is in your house and bites you, then that's an evil shark. Yeah, that's on the shark. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go into the shark's house, then that's where the shark lives. Fuck around and find out. You're, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of touched on this, but my next category of culture was discrimination, because I thought we needed to pull that out into its own thing. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get into it. Yeah, I was thinking definitely in terms of magical discrimination, which we know is all based on blood status. Like, yeah. I just can't see that being a thing in Australia. Yeah. Mm. Like, I know it would have got brought over with the English yeah, colonizers. Initially, but sure. Initially. But, like, right yeah. now, if I met a person who told me they could track their family tree and, like, trace their lineage back or whatever, like, I would attack them. I'd be the like, brick. ew, what are you cringe. About? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, disgusting. Again, like, tall puppy syndrome. That's... Shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> yeah, shut up. What are you talking about? That's not real. That's, there's no such thing as the past. Like, are you having a go? Like, are you having a go at me? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's such a vibe. You're right. It would it would just be Aussies love underdogs. We hate snobs. Yeah, it does if sound like, snobby. Here's my blood lineage. I'm a pure blood. Like fuck yeah, it off, sounds man. like people who are like, oh yeah, I have like I have land in Scotland. I'm like a lord or whatever. Like it's like okay, <laughs> okay, you're from Wagga Wagga, Brendan. Like <laughs> um. yeah, I've got a real life example here. So beloved, my best friend in the world. I'm not going to say her yeah. name, but you know her. Uh, she got married yeah. last year? Yeah, last year. It, it, the reason I couldn't remember is because her wedding got delayed like a million times because of COVID. Yeah. It was a whole thing. 
but whatever. She ended up not being able to get married in the place that she wanted to get married because of COVID and lockdowns mm-hmm. and restrictions. And sort of at the last minute was scrambling for a new place. And she was like, oh, we found out that we can have our wedding at yeah. this place, which is, uh, it's called the something homestead. And the homestead is named after the surname of her husband. And I'm like, that's a crazy yeah. coincidence. Like, it's so weird that getting married in that place. And she's like, no, no, it's like his historical home, like his family's <laughs> home. They, they like donated the land to the government, but they can trace their family back to like when the land was colonized. Ew. And I'm like, Ew, Ew. fuck off. <laughs> Ew, that sucks. <laughs> oh no. I can't believe you're getting married to him. That's so yeah, cringe. That's cringe. I feel like that's definitely something that's more normalized in Britain and Europe, you know, because they had those historical yeah. like monarchies and lineages and lordships and all that sort of stuff. That's really cringe in this country. So yeah. Yeah. But like absolutely I didn't know about that. He never told me about that. It's not a thing that he talked not. about. And I like, would, as soon as I found I out would about never. it, it made me like him less. <laughs> I would take that to my grave. You cannot get that out of me in torture. Like <laughs> No. <laughs> oh, this is our historical home that we donated to the government and now it's like a reserved it's like a national park or something, this place. And they got special permission to get married there because they're part of the family. Oh, and I'm like, oh yikes. Yeah. Yikes, that sucks. You should get married in like a Macca's <laughs> parking lot or something. Yeah, it's. I see exactly what you're talking about. It would just be regular discrimination, regular yeah. racism, prejudice, regular prejudice, racism. classism. <laughs> you're from the country, I'm from inner Sydney, get fucked, all that sort of stuff, you know? Postcode yeah. discrimination. Just like. <laughs> Yeah, postcode discrimination was huge when we were growing up. We lived in, like, one area where, like, at our school there were kids from, like, four different postcodes and we fucking hated each other. (laughs) It was so stupid because they're literally, like, metres apart. Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Anyway. You can walk from one end to the other and hit these four postcodes. We're like, oh, you're from, like, 8-7? Well, I'm from 8-8, so. (laughs) Stupid. Yeah. Also... Uh, there is very much a culture of not liking England here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which I think, obviously it's because, you know, we were colonised or whatever, but it's interesting in terms of Harry Potter, which really promotes the English as, like, the yeah. best thing that you can be. It's also a kind of, like, self-drag, because a lot of people here do have that history of being either from England or descended from people who moved from England. We, we do. do. Yeah. Our mum moved here from England. <laughs> so it's definitely kind of like a self-drag, like tall poppy syndrome again yeah. like larrikin vibe where it's like yeah, yeah i we don't want to be known as the children of an Eng- english immigrant we want to be known as australians we fit in with everybody else yeah yeah and there's obviously there would be far more racial lines to that if this was a country other than england we we're talking about and if mm. we weren't white so i specifically wanted to talk about the idea of poms do you know is yeah. pom like a slang a slur that's known outside of australia slur is probably a strong word it's probably not a slur yeah no i wouldn't say slur Slang is what I meant. Probably not. POM is a derogatory term for English people. Yeah. It's derived from P-O-H-M, which is an acronym that was stamped onto the prison uniforms of the original convict settlers or colonizers. Yeah, yeah. So it stood for property of his or her majesty. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost immediately, the convicts started using POM as a slang term for their jailers and guards. Yeah. And eventually it became a word for all English people. Yeah. So we don't like the English. We don't like anything snobby that reminds us of the English or that we are English. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really don't think that, like, the idea of pure blood heritage or anything like that is a thing here. It just wouldn't be. No, no. Def- it isn't. Yeah. Definitely not to the same extent as it is in the UK. Like, yeah, it's kind of cringe. Yeah. It, would, it would be cringe if there'd be someone coming to, like, the Australian school and being like, oh, yeah, my my family have been wizards for generations. We can date it back to blah, 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 blah. Like, they'd get beaten up instantly. <laughs> Like, yeah. yeah, it's cringe. Yeah, I think, like, the idea of knowing that you're a pure blood or that you're a half-blood or whatever, it's like, you wouldn't know that. Mm. Who keeps track of that kind of thing? Like, obviously, you're going to know if you're muggle-born, because that just happened. Yeah. But, like, I couldn't tell you if you're half-blood or pure-blood or anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, who knows? Doesn't matter. Not relevant. Okay. Language. I definitely think that we call our muggles muggos. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's what we would call them. <laughs> Much better than nomad. That's so <laughs> stupid. I'm so sorry. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. I just don't even believe Americans would call them nomadges. It just sounds no, dumb. No, of course not. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they'd call them muggles. Uh, or some variation of muggles. Yeah. So Australians are very informal with our language. 
the Australian accent is apparently just the British accent if you're lazier and slurring all the words together like you're drunk. Is that true or is that just a stereotype? <laughs> it's something that I've heard. I don't know if it's true. I thought it was because it like... was so hot here so we take longer to say shit. Or is that dumb? <laughs> <laughs> we just draw it, draw it out, you know, because it's so we hot. We draw everything out and we slur all our words together. <laughs> Look, these are the stereotypes or the urban legends of where the Australian accent came from, so that tells you enough. <laughs> Another thing is that Aussies tend to give everything nicknames and just be very casual with the way that we address things, hence Muggle Muggo. Yeah. I found that in these episodes, we're leaning more into it because we're talking about our own country and cultures. So we are sort of just whacking on the slang whenever we can, which is good. I also thought you were talking about leaning more into the slurring thing is because (laughs) as soon as I said that, I became incredibly aware of how I'm pronouncing every word. No, no, I'm talking about the, the, the jargon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Palms, muggos. I think parcel tongue is going to be more common here because there's so many snakes. Hmm. And I also think that it's probably not considered a sign of evil here because snakes in Australia aren't symbols of evil. They're a fact of everyday life. Okay. So parcel tongues in the UK are descendant from one specific guy, Salazar so Slytherin. Yeah. But why? Why him? You know, like surely there's got to be other parcel tongues throughout history that aren't related to that mm-hmm. single guy. Like I can imagine, like you said, like First Nations people were here and then the country mm. was colonized. There's just more snakes here. Maybe there's more magical yeah. snakes. Obviously, we have the rainbow serpent or the rainbow dragon. I mm-hmm. could see that there is more of a history and a culture here of interacting with snakes and reptiles. So, yeah, we have our own version yeah. of it, I guess. Yeah, I think it just makes sense to me that in countries with more snakes and when snakes are more common parcel mouths are also more common yeah that makes sense i think part of the reason why it's so evil in britain is because they have very few snakes it's very unusual and weird Mm -hmm. so they have very very few parcel mouths and the most iconic and well-known parcel mouth is salazar southern okay and he taints it for everybody else makes sense like a bad apple spoiling the bunch where over here we don't have slytherin Mm mm-hmm and in other countries as well. I'm trying to think of other snake countries and all I'm coming up with is Brazil. Peru. Is Brazil known for having lots of snakes? Yeah. Peru. Yeah. India? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think parcel tongue as a language is just going to be more common in those areas. Mm. Why not? Yeah. So here it's more like this is a person with a, a useful skill or a useless skill, depending. Mm. I'm sure there would have... And it's... Sorry. I'm sure there would have been some stigma in early colonization. Because again, remember, these people are from Britain. So if they're seeing people interact with snakes, that would have caused a lot of stigma. But then over the years, Mm -hmm. when it becomes more normalized, more people are doing it. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably considered weird and maybe even a little bit dangerous. Mm. Like, like it's a freak talent, but it's not like an evil talent. It's just, it's odd. Yeah. Maybe it's like how writing with your left hand was a couple of decades ago. Yeah. But now it's like normal, chill. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. Like, it used to be something that was, like, a sinful thing yeah. that had to be corrected, and then over time we all just relaxed about it. Yeah, now you just got parsleys down the road and it's all good. For celebrations and rituals, I had... We have public holidays for sporting events. Yep, classic. The Melbourne Cup, AFL Grand Final. I think sporting events are huge Yeah, absolutely. And I put, I put most of my thoughts about sport in the institution section, because sport's an institution, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, like in the UK, like magic, they celebrate obviously Christmas, Easter, all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. So we were probably doing that too. We have those yeah. holidays here. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and we have seafood for Christmas because it's yeah. too hot. Yeah. Our Christmas rituals are very different from the Northern Hemisphere because our Christmas is right in the middle of summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another popular holiday here in Australia is Australia Day or Invasion Day. It's a very controversial mm-hmm. holiday. Because obviously it's it's a celebration of the nation and the country, but it's celebrated on the day that the country was quote unquote founded by colonists. So it's a very painful mm-hmm. day with painful memories for indigenous <clears throat> people. So I'm not sure yeah. how that might translate in a magical context because I don't even know. Like obviously in the UK and England for the magical population, they don't have like a day like that because they are the colonizer. <laughs> like I don't yeah. know, they don't have like an Independence Day, right? Do they? No, well, they wouldn't have an Independence Day because <laughs> the reason why other countries have independence is because they were getting independent from the British. Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, there's, not, there's not really much to say about that. There might be some sort of magical Australia Day, which is problematic, and it's a similar sort of discussions that we have every single invasion day in this country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, change the date. Yeah, change the date. We don't know much about public holidays and things like mm. that in magical britain because we're seeing it all from the perspective of a child and children don't get public holidays they get school holidays <laughs> like shit. so yeah 
either either they completely align with the muggle britain or they have their own that are completely different it's hard to say one thing that we do have here is compulsory voting so voting days for like i think basically every level of government are always either done on weekends most of the Mm. time or you get the day Mm -hmm. off to vote because everybody has to vote so they have to make it possible for us to get to the polling stations and vote yeah even if you're working on a weekend you can still take an hour or so off to go vote at a station mm-hmm. it's, it's very normal. and yeah. you can do early voting for weeks ahead of time yep you can postal do vote. postal voting yeah mm-hmm. it, we have everything possible to make it easy for people to vote we have volunteers who go into hospitals and hospices and get all the people there to vote Part of the bonus of that is on voting days, there's something called the democracy sausage, yeah. where a lot of places that are voting centres, which are often schools and public buildings like that, will have barbecues where you can go and get a sausage yeah. for voting. I think that's just something that's quintessentially Australian, and I think wizards have something similar, if they have democracy. <laughs> which they may not. I, we haven't decided yet. <laughs> they have a totalitarian society. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's like... Scrimgore got voted in, I guess, but I don't think there was elections every four years or whatever for Fudge. I think he just got no, voted in just there. like 20 years ago and he was just there. <laughs> yeah, hard to say. Yeah, it's definitely an office where you serve until you die. Because we know that I think Hermione took over from Kingsley, right? <laughs> it might just be longer terms, not four years, because, you know, wizards live longer. It might be wizards like 10 year longer, terms. Yeah. yeah that like makes that. sense. Yeah, so Fudge might have got voted in like twice or whatever. Yeah. Mm. okay oh god the culture is such a long section my next section was clothing oh i've got some stuff on this oh i do have a section on sports here i guess i didn't do that in institutions oh well we'll do clothing first yeah clothing robes ain't it not robes Uh, yeah (laughs) what i was thinking was a lot of hot desert countries do tend towards loose flowing clothing that covers the entire body Mm. you see that in traditional desert countries i've written dessert countries here (laughs) amazing (laughs) but the indigenous Australians didn't go in that direction. No. They went with minimal clothing and body paint to protect them from the from the sun. Yeah, yeah. And also, obviously, they were darker skinned people, so yeah, yeah. sunburn wasn't as much of a thing. But ha ha ha! I did my research, and it turns out that indigenous Australians wore cloaks made out of animal skin, mm-hmm. including possum, kangaroo, and wallaby, quoll, sugar glider, and emu. Oh, nice. So that's sick, and I love that. Awesome. That's amazing. I love that. I think that's definitely not an everyday thing. No. But, like, and it for might, special occasions. It might be a mob-only thing as well. Like, Yeah, exactly. I don't know if that's a thing that's open to white people or if it's an Indigenous Australian-only thing. Yeah. Either way, amazing. Like, oh, cool ceremonial, like, cloaks for special occasions. Yeah. Made out of, like, emu feathers and kangaroo skin. Awesome. Oh, fuck, that's so awesome. Hells yeah. I wish I could draw. <laughs> I know. I'm obsessed with the quoll cloak because I love quolls. They're, like, a spotted mm. possum, so that's a cool... Yeah. yeah, they're beautiful. Like, brown, but with, like, white spots on them. Mm-hmm. That would be gorgeous as a cloak. Yeah. Yeah, definitely for, like, uh, non-Indigenous Australians and, like, Australian wizards that are sort of integrated into Muggle spaces, I think that they have a better idea of Muggle styles because, remember, like, these are populations that were very side by side and were, like, mm-hmm. experiencing the evolution of Australia at the same time-ish. Yeah. So robes wouldn't be as popular. They'd sort of be more integrated into like whatever muggles are wearing what's appropriate for the weather like mm-hmm. robes are just inappropriate for the weather for the most part yeah like, <laughs> i think wizards abandoned robes like yeah not immediately they would have been around for a long time decades yeah but as newer generations started being born here it's like it's too hot for this why am i wearing yeah. this yeah it would yeah. just be abandoned too hot too windy as well mm. like you know we kind of need pants or something because it's yeah. like a bit inappropriate <laughs> yeah like Shorts, shirts, comfortable Mm -hmm. shoes, I think is kind of a vibe. I was thinking, because I think that's a little bit too muggle for me. I think it needs to be a bit different. So I was thinking fashion is leaning towards still long flowing fabric for both genders. Sure. But I think much, a much, much lighter fabric than like Mm -hmm. heavy wool clothes. Like a cotton. shit. Linen. Like a cotton or a linen, something really, really light. Yeah. So like maybe something skin tight underneath and then something loose over the top is what I'm thinking. Yep. And definitely shorter cuts lighter mm-hmm. fabrics i think we're may- maybe getting exposed shoulders and oh. knees oh <laughs> scandalous yeah yeah australian wizards are like slutty compared to the rest <laughs> of the country the rest of the international community <laughs> oh god i mean yeah. i think that's just a southern hemisphere thing like it's too hot it is it's, it's too ab- sticky it's, just a, 
It's a hot climate thing. Yeah. The only reason why all the wizard clothes we see are like covering you from neck to ankle is because we're only seeing wizards in colder climates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's everything I had for clothing. And then I apparently had a section on sports, which I didn't put in institutions. Do you want to talk about sports now or later? Um, we'll talk about them later. I'll talk first about like where do magical people live. If that helps. Yeah, where magic people live. And then I think we should talk about government and where that's established yeah. from there. Yeah, cool. All right, so where okay. do magical people live? I think everywhere. I can definitely yeah. see magical families that have a mix between magical and non-magical people being in mm-hmm. city centers, urban areas, and in suburbs. However, I think there is a really strong case to make for very much exclusively magical communities or more magical families to be living in country towns, rurally yeah. and remotely. Because it's just such a big country and it's so easy to hide like small tiny little villages like hogsmeade but i would say even smaller than that like yeah. communities of like a hundred people or something and all way around out in the middle of nowhere yeah, yeah. and all around everywhere. the country and like literally basically everyone there is magic or mm-hmm. related to a magical person so they know about it yeah like in on the secret at the very yeah. least and so whenever visitors come in the rare occasion that they do because there's nothing there it's mm-hmm. it's like a place you pass through everyone's on their best behavior because they can tell it's an outsider or mm-hmm. if something were to happen people have to step in and like make sure the secret is kept memory yeah. charms memory charms yeah but yeah it's very much just out in the open and so this implies mm-hmm. to me that the trace is not a thing here which also makes sense yeah i don't think it yeah, is because it can't be because <laughs> as we've discussed like the more the further inland you go the more palpably magical this country is so mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense that you can be monitoring oh your kid's not in school right now and they're doing magic out in the middle of nowhere where no one's gonna see them Mm-mm-mm. it's like no that's not happening <laughs> like <laughs> yeah there's no muggles around for seven thousand kilometers what do you want me to do not let my kid practice his homework you know it's just dumb yeah And also with the fact that our land is so much harsher and like we've got these dangerous animals and even the sun is a massive danger. Like I think you need to use magic. Exactly. Like I think it's the trace isn't a thing here. So that creates a lot of other issues in terms of schooling that we'll get to later. Exactly the same way that like we teach our kids to swim from toddlers and we teach our kids snake and spider safety from toddlers because you you can't have a four year old wandering around who's going to grab a hold of a snake. Like, you have to teach them to be safe. Like, I think it's the same. We teach them magic from a yeah. young, young age. So on the coast and in big urban yeah. centres and cities, there would be magic and magic people, but I think it would be more well hidden mm-hmm. than even in England. Because remember, the urbanisation of Australia yeah. is a very modern change to the environment. So I think Australian magic users would have found better ways to adapt and hide their own spaces within that environment. Yeah. So what I was thinking, because we talked about this in one of our episodes, history or land. No, we talked about this in land. The UK has a very small, dense population. We have a huge country with a widespread population. So I don't think there is one central magic place that would be insane. But I do think that all of the major cities around the country has like a Diagon Alley-esque style hidden street with a small collection of shops, a medical center, a pub... And some other basic shit. All that stuff. And yeah. Yeah. Obviously, some people live there, but I think most people don't live on that magic street. They live integrated into the Muggle Mm -hmm. city or in these small pocket communities and they travel into the city to do their essential needs in there and then they leave. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll be the same in like more country towns that are bigger. So, like places like Wollongong, right? Like, it'll be the same. There'll Mm -hmm. be, like, a little magical section, not as big as the magical section in, say, Sydney or Melbourne, but it's still there. And then there'll be rural towns that are either completely magical or half and half, and it's just a way of life. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, definitely. That's how I see it. Um, I have more now on where the government is and what the government looks like, if you want to get into that. Well, the first thing I wanted to say is a couple of episodes ago, I said all of our cities are on the coast except for one <laughs> special city that isn't on the coast for a very important reason. I'd like to explain that. Yeah. Then now. Yeah. That's, I literally, my first point is time for Rhea to rant about Canberra. Canberra. Okay. <laughs> so Canberra is an insane city. The capital city of Australia is Canberra. Mm-hmm. Why is that the case? Let me tell you. <laughs> Way, way back in the early 1900s, so when we got Federation, which was when we yeah. were, st- we're still a British colony and we're still under British rule, but Federation was, was when we're like, okay, Australia's going to have our own government, yeah. we're going to have our own country, blah, blah, yeah. blah. There was a massive disagreement about where the capital city of Australia was going to be. Every every state wanted their capital to be the capital city. Yeah. 
and it basically came down to Sydney and Melbourne. Biggest population. Which are the capital cities. Yeah. Yeah. The capital cities of New South Wales and Victoria are the biggest populations, biggest cities. Sydney was where the first fleet first landed and it was like the first colonized area and Melbourne is just the other huge city, yeah. bigger than all the others, and it's where a lot of people live. Yeah. We couldn't decide between these two cities. And the compromise that we decided on was basically take a ruler, get a map of Australia, draw a straight line between Melbourne and Sydney, and in the middle, that's where Canberra is going to be. Yeah. And so it landed in the state of New South Wales, because it's bigger, but we like sort of drew off a little separate area and we're like, okay, this is its own state. It's its own territory. It's called the Australian Capital Territory. <laughs> And it's not a part of New South Wales. It's not a part of Victoria. It's its own special thing. <laughs> and in there, we're going to build our own special city. And that's the city where the government lives. Yeah. And it's a whole city basically just built around the federal government of Australia. And pretty much everyone who lives and works there works for the government. <laughs> and it's this insane... It's like if the Ministry of Magic was its own city <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's just we've just done this in such an insane way why have we set up our government like this anyway take it away <laughs> yeah it's a rural basically a country town that's a city mm -hmm. very small it's literally 20 minutes from top to bottom if you drove the whole thing mm -hmm. it feels like a university but bigger yeah. because the whole thing is very planned mm -hmm. all the government buildings are very shiny and beautiful and manicured and everything's planned yes so it's a very clean small official city feels like a university <laughs> is great if you've been to yeah. like those campus towns that are like the university is the center of it and then all of the accommodation and all of the businesses and stuff nearby are all set up to support the students that live on and around campus it's that that's what Except it's like. instead of a yeah. university and students it's the government and everyone who works for the government so besides government buildings there's also a bunch of things in canberra like the National War mm -hmm. Memorial, National Museums, and like natural cultural centerpieces. Yeah. But basically it's just federal parliament. That's what federal parliament. That's yeah, what federal parliament and the um, big federal stuff, like the federal museum, <laughs> the federal history, the federal this. Yeah. So I can really see that similarly, the Australian Ministry of Magic would be located in Canberra. I'm just advocating yeah. for this. I was thinking either its own city somewhere else separate, but honestly, the story that we had to just compromise and create our own <laughs> government in the middle of the country, in the middle of the two places is so fucking funny. <laughs> like, what could we come up with that's better than that? Like, I think the magical government has to be there too. Yeah. So here's some fun facts. Canberra has an old parliament house. It's called the old parliament house. And I get into it why. It was built in 1923. So mm -hmm. not that old. <laughs> yeah. But, but old in terms of Australia, if we're counting from <laughs> colonization onwards. Yeah. And then we have a new parliament house built in 1988. Mm -hmm. And that's where the current federal parliament sits. The old parliament house is basically just a museum now. You can go there for tours and see what where old parliament would have sat. Mm -hmm. But the reason why we have these two parliament houses is because... In 1923, Old Parliament was sitting in Old Parliament House, right? Mm -hmm. But then the Parliament got too big. They got too many members, mm. like more states and territories were having more members and stuff like that. Mm, country so too basically, big. instead of, yeah, instead of like renovating Old Parliament House, making it bigger, making the chambers bigger, they just built a whole new one okay. <laughs> to make it bigger. So and then, that's, why, that's why that happened. And then the wizards <laughs> moved in like rats and took over the Old Parliament House. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really strong argument that like, you know, maybe the wizards were having like their own little council chambers mm -hmm. hidden away somewhere in like a little underground, pocket maybe. room of Old Parliament House or underground. Yeah. And maybe once Old Parliament House sort of became a museum and abandoned, they just sort of moved in like rats out of the sewers. Yeah. I could see that happening. Yeah, makes sense. And it's like, muggles think this is a museum, but really they just actually can't get into all of the rooms. <laughs> Most of the rooms are just sealed <laughs> off with magic, and that's where the magic government is. Yeah, yeah, I can really see that. Because I've actually done the old Parliament House tour, and there are plenty of rooms that you just can't access, and plenty of little yeah. hidden stairways that you can't go down. And they say it's because, you know, they're old and small and rickety, but we all know the real reason because <laughs> um, that's where the wizards are i love this because it's given me the vibes of skullduggery pleasant where the magic government's hidden in a wax museum <laughs> i love that there's also a very strong conspiracy theory in canberra of the canberra tunnels um Ooh. so this is basically it's very simple it's a conspiracy theory that underneath canberra are a series of elaborate tunnels that connect all the official buildings Oh, just like under Disneyland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just like a common joke. Like whenever there's like a power outage or something, everyone's like, oh, they must be doing construction in the tunnels or something like that. <laughs> like, you know, it's just a thing. 
Oh, yeah. like, and everyone has the jokes like, oh yeah, all the politicians use the tunnels to get around on their little motorbikes and stuff to get from place yeah. to place. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's true for wizards. <laughs> I do definitely think, yeah, it's like, the, it's like the mission city in like Futurama, how it's like underneath New York. I yeah. can definitely see a lot of the like, the mechanisms of the government and the political spaces are just sort of in this underground space. And then mm-hmm. they've used old Parliament House and it's just all connected underneath. And Yeah, that's the entry and exit point. I also want to mention something briefly. Uh, one of the most iconic buildings in Canberra is the Telstra Tower, named for... Yes, this is what I was going to suggest. <laughs> named for the big phone company Telstra. Telstra, yeah. And it's basically just a big sort of like strange looking skyline building. It's got a big head on it. And it's quite small. It looks like a big syringe, basically. It's a signal tower. Yeah, it's a signal for tower. For the phone signals. Yeah. yeah. It's like a big tower with a big red light on the top of it. <laughs> it's kind of shit. Like it's yeah. it's it's listed as one of like the big tourist attractions of Canberra, but Canberra's like it's only a tourist attraction because you can see it from wherever you're standing yeah. in, ta- in Canberra. You can always see it's just a <laughs> the it's a big tall thing on a hill, but it's not like good or fun. No. <laughs> it's meant to be like you go up there and you can see all of Canberra. But again, like like I said, Canberra's very small, very quiet, very official. It was yeah. built for a purpose. It's not much of a touristy attraction. Like if you I ask, fucking climb a tree and see all of Canberra. <laughs> if you ask any Australian, like, have you been to Canberra? They either say yes or no, and the people that do say yes are like, yeah, but I'm probably not going to go back. Like, what's the reason? <laughs> like, it's yeah. not, you know. <laughs> Here's the reasons to go to Canberra. I work in Canberra. I have to do some sort of government thing in Canberra, so I'm going to be there for like six months. Yeah. Uh, my family or friend lives in Canberra, so I visited. Or I was going somewhere else and Canberra was on the way and it's a convenient place to stop. Or I'm a year six, they're so on a school trip and we're going to Questacon yeah. and Parliament House. <laughs> yes, school trip in when I've got to learn about the government. Or the other reason is I'm not Australian, I'm some sort of foreign dignitary coming yeah. here for a government reason and I have to go there because it's the only place I'll go. Yeah, it's very much an official city. So the Telstra Tower is listed as this tourist attraction, right? But at least for the mm-hmm. last 11 months, it's just been closed. <laughs> it's just been mm-hmm. closed, like for no specific reason. Um, so I like to think that this is like a magical space or is being used as a magical space because if you've ever been there, it's very weird. It has weird vibes. You go inside, mm. there's like very disgruntled, uninspired employees who like don't care. <laughs> like you go in, you're like, oh, can I get a ticket up to like the deck so I can see the views? And they're like, oh, sure, if you want to. Like, you know, it's a bit of a waste of 20 I bucks. Guess. Like, if, And then they're like, make sure, make sure you check out the museum on the way out. You don't want to miss that. And you go see the museum and it sucks. It's just about phones. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> And they sell you like a seven dollar hot chocolate, and they're like, "Oh, hope you like it. It sucks. It tastes terrible." I love this. It's terrible <laughs> service to drive away the muggles. Yep. And I just That's... think if it's not a government building, I could really see it as like a central point for mail, post, something to do with the yeah. magpies and messages, because it's a it's a communications tower. Yeah, that makes sense. So I like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Huh. I really, I love the, this is such a wizard idea of, okay, let's have a place that's just for wizards. We don't want muggles here. It'll be a tourist trap that's designed to attract (laughs) muggles, but we'll make the service terrible so the muggles don't want to come and it'll always be closed. And there's always like specific areas that you can go. Like there's just the elevator up to the top and then the little cafe in the lobby and then the museum down below. So everything else is closed. You can't see anything else in the Telstra Tower. Mm -hmm. And also, fun fact, another name for the Telstra Tower is the Black Mountain Tower, which I think is very foreboding and fantasy, and I like to think that that's how the wizards refer yeah. to it. <laughs> uh, what I keep wanting to say is maybe that's where the prison is, the magical prison, but I have other ideas for the magical oh, prison. I didn't even think of the magical prison. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I, are we finished talking about government now? Because I'll go on to this. Yeah, let's talk about the prison and then I'll talk about the bank. Okay, good. Yes, I've got ideas for the bank as well. Okay, so the problem with the wizard prison is the Dementor issue. Yeah. Because the reason why Azkaban works is because it's a prison of your own mind that saps away your magic. Yeah. Which, look, ethical issues aside, it works. And other countries, we don't have Dementors because no. Dementors only live at Azkaban. So what's our magical prison? What I came up with is the idea of the Panopticon. Do you know the Panopticon? Yeah, yeah. Jeremy Bentham. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners, it's an 18th century prison design where basically the prison is designed like a circle. Mm -hmm. All of the cells are on the outside of the circle facing inward. And in the center of the circle is a big tower that's constantly manned by guards. And the idea is that all of the prisoners are constantly watched. Right. So you can see if they're up to something and they just have to basically sit in their cells and be good. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Australia was a prison colony at a period of time where the Panopticon was considered the peak of prison design. Hmm. So all of our prisons were set up as Panopticons. Most of them are in ruins now, but we have more Panopticon style prisons than anywhere else in the world. Fun fact. <laughs> Fun fact. So because we would have because wizards would have come over here and set up their prison at that time, I think it makes sense that they have a Panopticon style prison somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe instead of wizard guards watching all the wizards in the cells, it's some kind of like beholder style creature, beholder from Dungeons and Dragons. Sure. Basically just giant floating eyeball. That would solve the Dementor issue. And in terms of where it's located, before we brought up the Telstra Tower and its terrible vibes, <laughs> I was thinking either a small island along the shipwreck coast. Makes sense. Offshore detention. Yeah. Offshore detention. Big that's trends. how we yeah. how we roll. The Shipwreck Coast yeah. is a stretch of coast where a lot of the ships bringing colonizers and settlers over from England sail all the way from England to Australia and then crash into the Shipwreck Coast and die. It was really terrible, but that was just the way of it. There's mm -hmm. like a whole fucking haunted coastline full of terrible shipwreck <laughs> stories you can go to. So either yeah. a small island there or apparently there is something called the Bass Strait Triangle. Oh, no way. Which is, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know this. We have a mini Bermuda Triangle in Bass Strait. Oh, that's so cool. Which is the <laughs> the strait of water between Australia, the Australian mainland, and Tasmania, the tiny little island at the bottom. Right. So there's like a little triangle there where there's a bunch of mysterious aviation and maritime incidents. Nice. Or a wizard prison. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That adds up. Yeah. So I think we've got... A little, a tiny little island hidden somewhere in the Bass Strait Triangle, which has a Panopticon style prison on it with some kind of beholder esque creature that is like all eyes and just watches the prisons at all time to make sure they don't use magic. How about not even an island? How about underwater? Because that's another way that you can't mm. escape because you'll be crushed by the ocean's pressure and you have to swim mm. to the top. It's too far. Yeah, you can't breathe and you don't have your magic wand with you to help you and there's no gillyweed. Yeah, underwater's a good bet. Underwater is a very good idea. I like that. That also explains why it hasn't been found by the very <laughs> many people who travel back and forth through the Bass Strait constantly. <laughs> yeah. Underwater panopticon prison. Love it. Some sort cool. of evil beholder creature that's like from the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some sort of ocean beholder. I, I wish I had lore for this kind of creature, but unfortunately there's no giant eyeball monster in Australia's mythology that I'm aware of. I think also... I wish there was. It would probably be haunted by a lot of the ghosts from shipwrecked convicts and shit like that. Yes. And, yeah. Haunted underwater prison. Fuck yeah, this is great. <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> Time to write a horror story set there, I think. Yeah. I hope all this stuff that we're talking about inspires fanfics and stories and art. I want to see it. It'd be great. Hells yeah. The whole point of this episode is we want to be the authority of Magical <laughs> Australia. Everything we say is canon. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we have more informed Australian perspectives coming in and correcting yes, us, then add that to the canon, babes. Let's go. This is, yeah, I shouldn't have said canon because not canon. <laughs> this is fanon. Like, we're doing it. Join us. Be part of this fun adventure time. <laughs> we're building it together. I want to talk about money. Where's the bank? Yes. I've got Commerce. some stuff on Let's this. Let's go. So, first of all, in the UK, there's Gringotts, there's one bank. I think that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. We're not having one bank here. So ah. I think we're getting, like, yeah, there's one, like, overarching magical Australian bank, but there's not one location is what I'm getting at. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. what you're trying to say. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> thought there would be one bank. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of physical location, no. Yeah. Definitely lots of lots of other smaller locations dispersed out in your local town, your local wizard town, mm -hmm. in capital cities, etc. In the in the magical street that exists in all the major cities, like yeah. you were saying, I think yeah. there's like a bank there. Yeah. Um, I was looking into this. So in the real life world, Sydney, <laughs> <laughs> Sydney is the economic and financial heart of Australia. But yeah. up until the 70s, Melbourne was, right? Yeah, and, because we had the gold fields here. Yeah, gold fields. And so I think perhaps yeah. wizards are a little bit behind like they are with UK wizards. So maybe Melbourne, Victoria is where I'm going to locate the central bank or where the first one mm -hmm. was. And then I was looking more into it and I was remembering what we were talking about with the gold fields. And I thought about... Yeah, in our history episode. And I thought about Eureka. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense. And so I was looking into where Eureka is. It's in Ballarat, Victoria, which is like a rural mm -hmm. town in Victoria, a southern state. Um, yep. and I, ba Ballarat is known as like the goldfield yeah. place. Like if you want to go visit the goldfield, you stay in Ballarat. It's the golden town. Yeah. 
So I think it's a prime location for the magical bank. And mm-hmm. it could even be the name of the bank too. Like Eureka Bank is the, the name of the bank. Yeah, perfect. I love that. So to get to the bank, you have to go to the Welcome Nugget Monument, which is on yep. the corner of Mare Street and Humphrey Street in Bakery Hill, Ballarat. So the Welcome mm-hmm. Nugget was this famous gold nugget that was unearthed in around 1858, right on the spot where the memorial is placed in Ballarat. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was the largest gold nugget ever found. It weighed in at about 63 kilograms. Mm -hmm. It's massive. I just saw it when I was there with (laughs) mum and dad. It's huge. (laughs) Yeah. And you can look up this monument that's on the street. It's made of like cobbled stones and it has a replica nugget on it. And I think if you're a magic person and you wanted to visit the central first Eureka Bank for whatever reason, you want to withdraw like 5,000 galleons or something. Um, you'd mm-hmm. walk up to this monument and you'd like that it'd be covered in like notice me not charms as soon as you step on a certain stone or something. Yep. You tap the stones in a particular way, you say a magic word, you touch the nugget and a secret staircase or passageway is revealed down underneath into the earth. Mm-hmm. And so you go under the earth and Eureka Bank, I imagine it as like a series of tunnels akin to a mine shaft. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like dark, like only lit by the golden glow of like some hazy lights, dark, twisted, confusing, narrow, small. I want it to feel claustrophobic. I want it to feel Mm -hmm. dank, like that wet earth smell, like the smell of death, you know. Love it. And there's like goblins, there's wizards working down there. They also work with nifflers. So here's what I imagine. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, you go into these like twisted tunnels you go first of all down the little staircase and you end up in underneath the earth and you're guided somewhere to like the main lobby which is just it looks like a bunch of dirt and and, like (laughs) you say like oh you know this is my name this is my pin number or whatever i want to access my vault and so you might get in a mine cart but it doesn't go fast like the carts at gringotts because this is small dark twisted areas it's not like vast and cavernous like gringotts is so you go slowly, sometimes you have to get out, sometimes you have to crawl on hand and foot through small, <laughs> narrow spaces. I hate this. I hate it. <laughs> and that's if you want to, like, you know, see your vault for whatever reason. But mm-hmm. usually if you just want to withdraw something or make a transaction that's a bit lengthy, you just go to, like, the lobby where the main goblin or main wizard is, mm-hmm. and you'd say, hey, I want to withdraw, like, 500 galleons. And there's, like, some sort of pit next to the lobby, and there's, like, a <laughs> bunch of gurneys and pulleys and, and strings and big, like, cranks. And so... The wizards and goblins, and they like start pulling on these cranks, and the, like all the things are like grinding. And this is awful, like <laughs> sound. And then this, uh. like, up from the pit with the ropes, like this small wooden bucket appears with like 50 galleons in it. And that's they have to keep doing that and get 50 more galleons and 50 more galleons for you. But you know, it's from your vault because it's like a magic bucket, it goes to your vault, lots of yeah. stuff. And there's nifflers, I love this. There's nifflers down below that like know which vaults to go to and all this sort of stuff. Mm. Trained nifflers, perfect. So that's the that's the main bank, that's Eureka Bank. But then, okay, Fuck yes, that's in like Ballarat. Great. <laughs> that's in Ballarat, right? Mm-hmm. Say I live in like Cairns or like northern Queensland far away Mm -hmm. in a small rural town that is mainly magical so I have my magical section of my town I need to withdraw some money I go to my small magical street where there's like you know the post office the bookshop the pub and then there's like a small little like hole in the wall <laughs> for like Eureka Bank. And I knock on the glass and there's some annoyed, disgruntled teller there. And they're like, oh, and they open the blinds. And they're like, what do you want? And I'm like, all right, here's my name and pin number. And I want to withdraw this much from my account. And they like have to write a request and it gets sent off like in a pneumatic tube that doesn't go into like a pipe and disappears into nowhere. It sort of disappears in a puff of smoke. Yeah. And maybe I have to wait like three to eight business days to yeah. get that transaction <laughs> because I live far away from Ballarat. Mm-hmm. If I'm in Melbourne, I might be luckier. But oh, yeah, in Melbourne, it's like 12 <laughs> to 24 hours. Yeah, yeah, but I definitely want there to be like, yeah, it's an efficient system and it works, but it's kind of inconvenient. Like, you have to plan ahead because depending on where you are in the country, you're going to have to wait a bit to get your money. I Um, love that. I love that it replicates (laughs) the experience of being a tiny country with no people in the middle of fucking nowhere and needing something and being like, oh, it'll take like three weeks to get shipped to you and cost $85. And it's like, (laughs) I'm buying a paperclip. Like, why is it so hard? (laughs) Yeah. So that's how I imagine Eureka Bank works and deposits and transactions work. It's just like, it's more inconvenient if you live rurally and people will complain about it. But as soon as someone says, oh, well, how would you do it better? They're like, oh, yeah, I don't actually know. (laughs) I don't know how I'd do it better. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is what's been here since the days of the gold field. So, like, I guess (laughs) it's great. Yeah. But definitely a bunch of little tellers and little 
Eureka Banks everywhere, but they're all connected to the one in Ballarat. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I love this. All I had was that we said <laughs> the goblins came over from Europe during the gold rush and established a bank in the gold fields. So I yep. was thinking something in an abandoned gold mine, maybe there's actually an entire goblin settlement somewhere out in the gold fields now. Like they took sure. over a town and built themselves a place to live. But That's I love it. yours. I think it's great. This is perfect. Eureka Bank. Done. <laughs> the only thing that I wanted to add or change was I don't think we're doing galleons, sickles, and nuts. Okay. I think our real life currency is dollars and cents, so I think they're doing dollar dos and nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the thing about Australian money is we have the least counterfeitable money in the world. Mm -hmm. All of our notes are different shapes, diff not different shapes, they're different sizes and different colours. Yeah. And all of our coins are different sizes, many different shapes, and they're annoying. Yeah. So I think wizards are taking that to the illogical extreme. <laughs> All of their money are completely different sizes, shapes, colors, and textures, it's really, tastes. Yeah, textures. <laughs> it's really annoying to carry and use magic Australian money. <laughs> yep. It's like all the different denominations. <laughs> Some of them might be like a cube and a square. <laughs> Some of them are like a note. Some of them are like coins, yeah. but like with holes through the center and like a triangle shape. It's all completely different. And they're brightly colored like mm. Lego blocks. Yeah. And but... it's just a fucking nightmare. <laughs> but goblins and people who work at the bank can tell if it's a counterfeit one. They can look at it instantly. They can hold it in their hand and be like, yeah, this is real. And that one's not real. Like it's they just, just no. It's, it's just impossible instinct. to replicate. <laughs> We don't have counterfeiting here. It's just not a thing. Everyone's like, no, that's way too much effort and I'm going to get caught immediately. <laughs> I have next, where did people go shopping, play sports, go on holiday? What sort of, what's like the cultural institutions there? Do we want to get into that? Okay. The only other things that I had as like institutions were health, transportation and communication and sports. Sure. Let's get into it. Start with health. Okay. All right. So uh, I don't think there's a central hospital. I don't think we have a St. Mungo's. No. I said briefly earlier when I was saying this magical street in all the major towns has a medical center. I think yeah. there's small medical centers in appropriate places. But in Australia, we have something called the Flying Doctors. Yeah, of course. Which yeah. I don't know is a thing in other countries. It is, but it's most common here. It's most popular here. Yeah. So definitely, like, it's still a thing now. But uh, it used to be a thing back in history times before medicine was good. We have like a system of planes that flies all over the country along certain set routes to get doctors out to rural remote places where they need to be and also to bring sick or very injured people who are in need of desperate urgent care to major city centres where they can get appropriate care. So... I think a magical version of flying doctors where like yeah. our healers fly all over the country wherever they're needed, maybe on the back of like winged horses or giant kookaburras or something. Mm -hmm. Even just brooms as well. Just brooms like... as well. They have a system of flying doctors that travel the country and the doctors travel to places for like general shit and for major shit, you can get traveled to the doctors if you need to. Great. Perfect. <laughs> Nothing to add there for health? Not particularly. No. Okay. I... Do you want to do transportation and communication? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. We definitely don't have a flu network because we don't have indoor fireplaces. That's just no. not a thing. So apparition for short range things, but there's a distance limit and Australia has big distances. So I don't think you could apparate between cities, for example. Mm -hmm. So port keys for long range travel. But I think our major system of transportation is broomsticks, flying animals. Uh, we ride mm -hmm. kangaroos as well. <laughs> Yeah, I like to think we have some sort of version of flu powder that has to do with fire or smoke. Because, mm -hmm. like, yeah, we don't have, like, fireplaces in every home. Like, they exist in some parts of the country, like, in colder yeah. climates, but not in every home. But, you know, you could go outside and make a fire pit, or you could find a place where you can make a campfire and use the smoke to travel somewhere. I think that's yeah. reasonable. I think traveling between rural areas, that would be really good. Not in major cities, because I couldn't no. step out of my apartment and set a fire. Oh, definitely not. But like yeah. in more country towns, you know, you make a fire pit outside, you use a smoke to travel like thousands of kilometers. I could see it. Yeah, um, I can see that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking, what if flying cars are legal here? Oh, huh. Like they're, they're illegal in Britain, but what if they're not illegal here, especially in the outback? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think it's very iconic Australia to have like... What is it called? Like the use, the Holden use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's a vibe. Wizards just have flying cars here. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's definitely a mix mm. of a bunch of things, but I like flying cars, flying motorcycles as well. Yeah. You it's also... giving like 
Sand Warrior Mad Max vibes, you know? Yes, Mad Max, absolutely. <laughs> That's absolutely the vibe. Yeah. You mentioned that our male bird are undomesticated magpies, which I love. I love. I'm not changing that at all. But I do think we need a more viable form of communication. <laughs> so I was thinking maybe magic mirrors as kind of like cell phones or yeah. magical fires in jars that we can talk into. Yeah, I like magic mirrors. That works yeah. a lot. Um, because most of the time when you go bushwalking, they give you a mirror as well. Oh, do they? Attention. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, perfect. Magic mirrors is our like cell phone equivalent. Yeah. Then. If you get lost in the bush, they give you lots of stuff to you know, get attention with. Yeah, that, cool. that works. I love that. <laughs> uh, that's everything I had for transportation and communication. <laughs> Great. And if we if we're arguing that the Black Mountain Tower is kind of like our central post office, I guess some Ooh. some magpies might be there, some domesticated ones, or it could just be a place where like the magpies tend to congregate, so they built it there. <laughs> uh, I immediately went to like remember in olden timey days when like there were women who sat in rooms with a big switchboard in front of them and they physically oh, made yeah. the wires to the phones go like they would unplug the wire and be like connecting you and they would physically connect you that but with a incredibly intricate system of thousands of mirrors oh I love that <laughs> yeah that's great that's cool oh, that's so cool that's oh, that's why Telstra Tower is so cursed it's full of just mirrors yeah. of people talking and the witches and wizards who work there are just like let me just line up the correct mirror so you can have a conversation oh that's awesome FaceTime <laughs> FaceTime <laughs> but done in a convoluted and stupid magic way of course <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that so much. That's so cool. I want to see the ladies with their magic mirrors. Yeah. I imagine them all in like that 1940s, 50s dress as well for no reason. Of course. Of course. They haven't moved on. The big beehive hairdo and the glasses. Yeah. I'm, I'm picturing the woman from Atlantis. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. I've got a bit about sports. Are we up to sports? Yeah, we're up to sports. Okay. Sports is huge in this country. Like we've got yeah. public holidays for it, like you said. So we've mentioned before that there's an Australian Quidditch League and that the two biggest yes. teams are Thunderlara Thunderers and Wollongong Warriors. Mm -hmm. So I think that both these towns would have a massive Quidditch stadium in or around them. So I was doing mm -hmm. some research into this. Thunderlara, yeah. I thought it was just like a small rural town. No, it's a conservation reserve. It's just nature. There's no town. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, well then logically this must be a completely magical town. It's off the map. So the only people who oh, live there are right. wizards, magical people. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, because in our Quidditch episode, I was like, oh, Wollongong has a population of several thousand and Thundalara has a population of like 200 or something insane. Yeah, that's probably just the wider area, but Thundalara itself is in that nature conservation. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's a magical town. Perfect. Magical that makes town. sense. That's why, yeah. we, that's why we're like, this is a stupid thing that makes no sense and is insane. <laughs> it's a magical town. I definitely think there's probably more of an indigenous population there. Mm -hmm. Great. And so they can basically have their stadium anywhere. A lot of that area is nature reserve. So I'm more inclined to have them not have a stadium in that nature reserve. But wizards are wizards. They might do wizard shit. There's like a whole mm -hmm. swamp there they could use to put a fucking Quidditch pitch in. Oh, swamp stadium. Perfect. Like Queer Ditch March. The, you know, the original, yeah. you know. Uh, I was looking into Wollongong. It's a pretty big coastal city south of Sydney. Mm -hmm. There's not much space to hide a Quidditch stadium. So then I was looking at the map and I saw that there's this island off the coast called Flinders Islet. It's about four hectares wide, and there's a famous sailing race that goes to the island. But mm. I think during the off-season, that's a big Quidditch stadium, and they're practicing and they're playing there. So when that's these great. two towns are going to war with their Quidditch, it would just be like home visitor, the go-back between Thunderlar and Wollongong, and everyone would come to see. And mm -hmm. It'd be intense. Uh, yeah. One other like canonical Quidditch thing I found was there is art from a game, like some sort of Quidditch game, yeah. which has the Australian National Quidditch Stadium, right. which is hidden in a rocky canyon in the central Australian outback. Okay, sure. And if you if you just Google Australian National Quidditch Stadium, you'll find a few images of it. Very, very low-res <laughs> images of a game. Uh, it's like all in red, and there's yeah. big banners with Indigenous art, and didgeridoos play when you score a goal. It just looks sick. I think awesome. that's great. Yeah, that's definitely yeah, cool. cool. I can definitely see like the big like National Quidditch League mm -hmm. games going there as well. Um, that's great. Yeah, like that's our that's our national stadium. Besides Quidditch, I can see aquatic sports as a big thing. So like surfing, sailing, swimming, that's a big thing here. Yeah, we have a huge surfing culture. Like the surfy dude is like a stereotypical. Australian. Yeah, the grommet, the grommet. Yeah, yeah. grommet. 
racing as well because we've got lots of flat sparse land so i can see broom racing magical creature racing and riding that sort mm-hmm. of vibe yeah i think ping pop started in australia <laughs> <laughs> i also invented another one <laughs> Okay, perfect. Great. I have another sports pitch as well, so that's good. Okay, I'm calling this one Billy Bum. It's Ooh. an unofficial sport, question mark. Basically, <laughs> here it is. You and your opponent sting yourselves with billywigs, right? To make you both levitate about three feet off the right. ground. You brawl. Whoever's bum uh-huh. hits the ground first is out. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I think that is massively, massively popular among teenagers. Yeah. But I can also see it happening at, like, a competitive level. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, it's, some, it's something that would have started in the schoolyard. Like, it's basically just bullying. Yeah. But then I could definitely see it being like, oh, it's like boxing, you know? Like, there's a, yes, ga- there's, a would... there's a Billy Bum match between person A and person B. Like, it's going to be intense. And that yeah. one will actually have rules. Like, you can't gouge each other's eyes out. You can't, like, yeah. twist your nipples or anything. It actually has standards to it, unlike street rules, Billy Bum. But... Yeah. I was going to say, like, (laughs) boxing is a perfect example because I can really see this as a thing that happens, like, in bars and in pubs when everybody's drunk. Yeah. There's, like, we play a game of Billy Bomb. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. For money. Yeah. (laughs) I love that. Something that I think is the case is we have Aussie rules football here, yeah. where we just play our own version of football with our own rules, I guess. I couldn't tell you what they are or why, (laughs) but that's a thing. So I think we have Aussie rules Quidditch. Absolutely. Where we play the game by our own rules. There's more bludgers. Yeah. Ten people to a team. And it's a contact sport now. You can tackle each other off your brooms. Yeah. And they all have to wear little booty shorts. That's the rule. Yeah, that's um. the rule. It's important. <laughs> it's important to see each other's thighs. <laughs> it's very important. Yeah, very important reasons. Yeah, and I just, I think Quidditch as a culture is thriving here. Like, sport is huge oh, in Australia. Course. I think there's tons of teams and like yeah. we have a national league even though we barely have the population to support it like 80 percent of the population yeah. is invested in quidditch it's huge and like think about in the harry potter books when they're staying at the weasley's house right and they have to like go to like this abandoned field mm-hmm. to like practice quidditch but they can only do it at certain times of the day when it's quiet and there's no muggles around yeah and they have to stay below the tree line yeah yeah fuck that like in australia there's just big like parts of the country where no muggles are going there's big magical communities it's empty space there's plenty of space to like practice quidditch yeah. like it's we're getting good at that sport mm-hmm. absolutely <laughs> i imagine australia and japan are having an epic quidditch match <laughs> yeah because we know quidditch is huge in japan as well yeah <laughs> yeah i think australia and japan have like a maybe not like a formal league but there's like an agreement that we will play with each other all the time, constantly. <laughs> State of origin, but make it international. <laughs> yes, exactly. State of origin, but just with Japan and Australia. <laughs> State of origin, by the way, is a football competition. A football competition? A sport competition? <laughs> I don't know if it's football. That happens between two of the states here in Australia that just like to fight each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Another sport that I have is one that I'm stealing from Sands Pants Radio, Plumbing the Death Star, episode 150. They were talking about Magical Australia like we are, except ours is far better and superior. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But if, if you want to listen to the competition, Plumbing the Death Star, episode 150, they invented a sport, they didn't give it a name, which is unique to Australia, which is like horseback polo, but okay. it's played with one team riding kangaroos and the other team riding emus. And you have bats and a ball and you smack along the ground and you race on your giant animals. Perfect. I love it. Fuck yeah. Great. <laughs> so good I had to repeat the, the idea verbatim. I just stole it from them. <laughs> My idea now. <laughs> we'll tag that episode in the show notes. Yeah. I also think we have competitive dueling and like our magic surfing competitions are stupid. Holidays. Plenty of Aussies holiday within our own country. Yeah. Caravanning is a huge thing here because of course like you can just go road tripping around the country. Popular destinations for international holidays include the Pacific Islands, mm-hmm. Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and New Zealand, the big ones. So same Bali. with like wizards, I would guess. Yeah, Bali's huge. Yeah, Bali. Wiz- wizards would just be traveling and, you know, seeing all these places. Mm-hmm. I think it's very common for like during Christmas holidays to just like go camping, go traveling and mm-hmm. go somewhere else. So yeah, it's quite often to, like you'll go see a family for Christmas and then go camping for New Year's. I think that's yeah. really a common thing that happens. Great. Oh, there should definitely be... What's the fucking festival that we have? Um, well, we've got lots of music festivals, if you're talking about that. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the one that we that is over New Year's that we've been to a couple Woodford. of times. Woodford, thank you. Yeah, I kept yeah. reaching for Woodstock, but that's the right wrong word. 
There should yeah. definitely be some sort of magical version of Woodford. I'm going to say Woodstock again. Oh yeah, I've already said that. I, I have that in um, other cultural Perfect. institutions, which is like music and music festivals mm-hmm. are a big thing here. In Tasmania, we have a rather famous one called Dark FOMO, which is a bit problematic. Over the years, there's been a lot of bad news oh. about it. Um, but basically, I think that like 100%, there's annually some sort of magic, huge musical or arts mm. festival somewhere in the middle of the bush. Yeah. Woodford yeah, is known for like performing that. arts, like the circus arts and burlesque and comedy. Yeah. And, like music is the major thing, but there's all sorts of other stuff there. And like alternative culture, like hippie yeah. stuff as well. Yeah. I could definitely see that. There's also like, there's the Rainbow Serpent mm. Music Festival up in, I think, maybe it's South Australia or maybe it's Northern mm-hmm. Territory. I've got now. But yeah, there's everywhere. There's always a music festival in Australia without a doubt. Splendor in the Grass, Falls, like, you Big know. Big Day Out, is that one? Big Day Out, yep, classic. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Splendor in the Grass, fantastic. Oh, how was I not thinking of music festivals? Thank God you said it. The arts, one of our most famous landmarks in Australia is for the arts, the Opera House. Mm. So I think that's more of a thing of here. Like, We know that in the UK and Hogwarts specifically, Hogwarts does not have arts, theatre, singing or music particularly. I mean, obviously there's all the music extracurriculars, but they mm-hmm. don't count. There's no theatre because of some sort of terrible incident that happened with an Ashwinder years ago during a performance. Yeah. But I think that's bullshit. There's definitely a huge art scene here in Australia. Theatre, music, dance, mm-hmm. massive. So... Especially, like, thinking of the Indigenous Australian roots as well, like, how integral music and storytelling and, like, performance and dance is to Indigenous cultures. Like, absolutely that bleeds out to the entire country, as well as being, of course, Mm -hmm. integral to their culture. Basically, anytime you see a theatre production or a show in this country, there's an announcement at the beginning saying, like, the First Nations people of Australia were the original storytellers mm. and we thank them for their, like, contribution to arts mm-hmm. and culture, basically. It's, yeah, it's important. And then I have, but lest we forget, the biggest cultural institution in Australia of being outdoors yeah. while drinking. We've already talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> I have some stuff here about magic and like common spells, common magic. Stuff. Yeah, I've moved through all of my muggle notes and I'm firmly into magic now. All I've got left is magic sections. Common spells. Yes. Let's list them off. I think there's an air con spell. Air con spell. I think absolutely. there's water and ice spells, mm-hmm. bog repellent spells, yes. signaling and messenger spells. Here's what I was thinking. Those would be the very first like <laughs> Australian spell was some kind of a fly shield charm similar <laughs> to the cork hats. Yeah. Yeah. The iconically Australian hat of like a big broad brimmed hat which has corks on strings dangling down all the way around the brim to keep away flies. I think our most commonly used potion is some sort of sunscreen potion. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think signaling and messenger spells are big. I'll just come back to that because, again, mm-hmm. we've established that getting messages around this country is a bit difficult and annoying. So I think yeah. what we see in the Harry Potter series with the Patronuses where you can speak a message into it, I think mm-hmm. we have something like that that's a little less intense, a little easier to do so children can do it. Like a walkie talkie spell. Yeah, a walkie talkie spell, something to that design. Mm hmm. I like that idea. Sending a smoke message, you know. Yeah, a smoke message is good, or like an animal messenger, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of like, yeah, like you said, potions, lots of use of native plants and animals and resources Mm -hmm. to make ointments, potions. Yeah. For healing and cooking especially, I think potions are huge here. Yeah. And alcohol and potions. (laughs) Alcohol and beauty would be a big one. Beauty, of course. I forgot about beauty. Because I'm just so naturally beautiful, I don't think about it. <laughs> I know, we don't even think about it. Yeah. But there's a huge cosmetics and beauty culture here, especially mm. with using natural resources, things like eucalyptus and, like, yeah. wattle and all this sort of stuff. Like, so I could definitely see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, wand law. I think that we have, first of all, entirely our own culture of wand law because we've got all of our own plants yeah. and animals again. I don't want to just start listing them. But I think, yeah, our magic is going to feel different because our, wand, our wands use different components. And I'm imagining yeah, things like a Banksia bark wand with an echidna spike core, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Ghost gum wand with um, like the tail of some sort of like fish in it. Yeah, or like that. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, distinctly Australian magic, and this is obviously coming back to First Nations magic. I think smoking mm-hmm. ceremonies for healing and transport and cleansing would be important. Mm-hmm. I think some sort of boomerang spell or ah. like this phenomena of like casting that comes back so say i'm a wizard and i'm using wandless magic or even magic with a wand and i'm set, casting incendio or a fire mm-hmm. spell i cast that incendio at a target 
maybe it hits it maybe it doesn't but once it's hit it it actually spirals back to my wand or to my hand so i can choose to use it again or extinguish it i think that's just a common thing that's built into the magical teachings here i love that the idea of like a spell that you sort of throw from one hand and then catch in the other and maybe you can hit multiple targets with it that way yeah boomerang spells great definitely also when you said boomerang spell the first thing i thought was communication again maybe Mm. like a boomerang whisper spell like i whisper something into my hand the target has a chance to hear it and then whisper something back to me so it's like we send a message two ways that's great instead of one way that's the walkie talkie spell but like a boomerang yeah i love that yeah it's a boomerang whisper spell and that's something that you teach to children to whisper to each other Mm. i definitely think like most if not all spells can have this modification of having that boomerang quality where they can travel and circle back to you or come back i like that Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's great. And I love that as a, like, distinctly Australian school of magic. Like, it's not taught or practiced anywhere else. It's a invention of ours. Yeah. Um, that's all I really had on, like, distinctly Australian magic and what the magic might look like. Mm-hmm. Did you have anything else on that? I had a little thing on house elves. Sure. I think there are either no house elves or they are incredibly rare. Yeah. Because we talked about we know stolen house- generations influence yeah. with this. Yeah. Yeah, of course. We know that house elves are tied to old wizarding families, but I also think they're tied to the homes and the houses themselves. Mm -hmm. So the places, I think wizards would have had a lot of trouble bringing them across to a new country. I think you could get them here, but then I think they just wouldn't reproduce or thrive. I think they would die out. Yeah. So there's no house elves here, basically, except ones that have been brought across or maybe a few that were born here, but they're, they're no good compared to other house elves. So that means there's definitely more of a culture, and this makes sense too, because Australia was, like, for lack of a better word, founded on the idea of, like, everyone has to work hard and then they get a Mm. fair go. There is more of a culture of taking care of your own house. You know, everyone learns those domestic charms, those cleaning charms and cooking charms, because why would would there be a lord that has a house off, you know? Yeah, there's not, like, the vibe of lords and servants and stuff. That doesn't work. I mean, so yeah. yeah. Mateship... Yeah, yeah, there would be, of course. There would have been, but, especially back in Stolen Generations times, we talked about this, but I think that culture yeah. has obviously died off, especially post-70s. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, more generally, it's 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 the mateship and the battler and the fair go. Like, everybody has to work and take care of themselves. You don't have a slave race. Okay, so I think we should talk about technology and science because I think we've talked a lot about how Australian wizards are sort of more integrated with muggles yeah yeah Mm -hmm. maybe not the muggles themselves but they're integrated into muggle places and i think that's going to bleed over into technology so like i think they Mm -hmm. have magic cars radio yeah that's another possible use for telstra tower it could be a giant magical radio (laughs) tower (laughs) (laughs) yeah i think australian wizards just have more muggle stuff i don't know if that necessarily translates to a culture of like respect of muggles it might because we're mateship Mm. you know (laughs) <laughs> yeah we're all in this yeah. together <laughs> i don't see there as like a huge anti-muggo agenda it's it'd mm. be more like a fringe thing like there'd be some people that are like fuck muggos but yeah in general i think it's more chill than it is in the uk yeah i think it's more like muggles are beneath us not in a like we need to kill them or enslave them kind of way more just like you know they're not really part of our thing that we've got going on here yeah but they're fine and sometimes they have good ideas yeah i think that's the vibe of australian wizards and muggles yeah muggos the other thing that i was thinking in terms of science this is barely science we're gonna have different uh astrology no not astrology we're gonna have different astronomy yeah because all of our constellations are different sure absolutely and we know that in in hogwarts like they study astronomy because magic is tied to the movement of the stars and yeah constellations and stuff we're gonna have different stuff here for that i actually have a bit about that but it's in my school section so maybe i'll leave that to the next episode yeah we can talk about that next time then so the last category that i had for culture was novelty and humor mm-hmm. a lot of the wizarding world that we see is based in whimsy and humor <laughs> especially i think because we're getting a lot of stuff that's targeted at children so we're getting yeah. a lot of joke shops and candy stores and pranks and all that kind of stuff <laughs> Aussies are known for their sense of humour, like the whole larrikin thing that I was just talking about. Yeah. But I think we tend to trend towards more darkly ironic and self-mocking. Yeah. Gallows humour as well is a big one. Gallows humour. Yeah, that's that's big in Australia. Uh, So I think we definitely have, like, even just with the sports we were coming up with for a minute, a minute ago, (laughs) it's like we came up with deliberately dumb, reckless, dangerous sports with the idea that, like, it's 
more fun if people are getting hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a yeah. thing for wizards, but I definitely think it's a thing for Australians as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Humour, I think, is a big part of wizarding culture, but I think it might be a little bit darker than it than what we see in the Harry Potter series. Yeah, definitely. Did you have any more thoughts on Australian culture? Because I've pretty much run through all of my notes. I didn't have any more thoughts on Australian culture beyond uh, some of the questions we talked about at the end of our history episode, mm-hmm. which was, like, where are we now historically mm. – and culturally and like you know naturally australia is at this interesting time where like we're coming to terms with a lot of our past and like yeah we're more aware of the disadvantages and inequalities in our own society and like you Mm -hmm. know we're looking for change so i think that's good to sort of tack on the end of culture here where it's like i guess you know we're at this transitional time in our culture we're becoming more aware we're becoming more socially conscious and maybe we're Mm -hmm. like you know more respectful of our land and our history so i think that's good and hopefully i think that's trending towards a lighter future (laughs) i don't know i hope so yeah we've kind of we talked about in our previous episodes land and history like you said we're becoming more aware of our land our relationship with our land and like the way that our climate is changing the whole earth is gonna have to come to terms with this shit (laughs) and definitely there is more knowledge and hopefully tolerance of respect for indigenous peoples now than there has ever been. I Mm. really hope we continue in that direction. I would love to change the date of Australia day. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if it should necessarily be moved to sorry day because I think sorry day should be its own thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I've, I've yeah. seen campaigns for let's move Australia Day to Sorry Day. And I'm like, no, I really think no, Sorry no. Day should be its own moment. And then the day for us getting drunk outside and wearing Australian flags and running around and hitting each other with things should be a different day. <laughs> yeah, a lot, I've seen a lot of people say May 8 because it's mate. Mate, yeah, perfect. But there's a strong push to have it in the summer. So Fair that's enough. Like end of the yeah. year or start of the year. So whatever. But we can figure that out, honestly. I think, yeah, we should change the date, yeah. obviously. It wouldn't um, even have to be a major change. Like, if we want to keep it in summer, just... It, at the moment, it's sort of late January. If we moved it to a time in mid-January or mid to late February, yeah, perfect. February. How about yeah. end of February for end of summer? Yeah, easy. Great. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, in terms of, like, cultural change, beyond just, like, becoming better to each other and ourselves and the land, like, I don't have big dreams for Australia's culture. <laughs> I think we should just continue to improve. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a great sentiment. Um, yeah. You know, we're all mates and <laughs> just be a good bloke. <laughs> just be a good bloke. <laughs> to quote Sans Pants again. Yeah, to quote Sans Pants uh. Radio again. Also, don't be better than anyone else. Tall poppy syndrome. Yeah. Be a good bloke. Don't be the best bloke. Yeah. Don't. What's the, what's the saying? Be a mad cunt, not a shit cunt. Yeah. Be a mad cunt, not a shit cunt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I've been Jem. Hopefully a mad cunt. <laughs> I've been Rhea. Sometimes a shit cunt. Thanks for listening. If you want to support us or get in touch, the links to our social media and Patreon are in the show notes. Please feel free to send us so many messages that we go mad and run away to a hut on a rock in the middle of the sea just to avoid them. You'll hear from us again in two weeks' time.